We're going to look at one verse of Scripture, uh, 1 John chapter 4. We'll get there in just a minute. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about and we've been sharing with you some things that the Lord's really put on my heart for uh, you and I. The Lord has put within every believer the capacity and the endowment and the, the ability to overcome the challenges and the difficulties of life. He has put those in you already because you are a child of God. He's already placed those things in you. So the title of today's message is that, that is the overcomer's DNA. You realize that you have a physical DNA. Uh, scientists and uh, medical science has found and told us that our DNA is in every cell of our body, and it controls or it dictates your height, your 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 size, the color of your eyes, the preclerol condition and color of your hair, uh, and, and or or for the guys pre uh, just for men, and so we recommend recognize that God has put that on the inside of us already for us to, uh, and so we know who we are. So that simply means that I am a product, my DNA is a product of the DNA of Luke and Lucille Benton. But it also goes back generations before that. In fact, there are uh, websites now that you can go on and they'll send you a DNA kit and they will tell you they will match your DNA and they'll tell you where your ancestry came from as far back as their DNA records have it. Uh, and so you can find out which you know tree your family came out of. Amen. Which family tree... Uh, monkey or whatever your family came from. Amen. So we're just kidding. You know, you understand that. But you realize that God has given us not just a, uh, a physical DNA, but we also have a spiritual DNA. A DNA that allows us, that's already put on the inside of us, that if we understand the spiritual DNA, that every area will help us to overcome the difficulties and the challenges because that's what we are equipped in. The keys to, over, to being an overcomer are found within the DNA of every child of God. Dis, discovering and applying those keys will make, go, go a long way in our favorable outcome and the overcoming of the challenges of life. Jesus made the statement in John 16, uh, verse 33, and he says, In the world you will have tribulations. You might say we'll have tests, we'll have trials, we'll have problems, we'll have difficulties. But he said, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. With the indication is that because he overcame, we can overcome. He didn't overcome just because he was a child of God. He overcame as a man, empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit. And so he's given us those same things. So we looked at the fact that as believers, we can overcome the, the challenges of the world. We can come overcome the temptations of the flesh. And we can overcome the, uh, the uh, attacks and the, uh, the attacks of the devil. Uh, we can overcome those things. The Word says that God hasn't given us a spirit of what? Fear. But He's given us a, a spirit of love, of power, and a sound mind. And the Lord spoke to me and said that he's, He hasn't given us a, a spiritual terrorist, but He's given us the capacity to overcome a spiritual terrorist called the spirit of fear. And that we resist that spirit. We resist the enemy. Now, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 uh, says this. He says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Or he that's in you is greater than he that is in the world. Now, you might say it this way. The, the things the Spirit of God has put on the inside of you, has brought with you, is causes you to be greater than the one who's on the outside of you. The one who is in the world, endeavoring to give you the difficulty difficulties and give you the trouble and the challenges that you that you're facing. 
Last week, we looked at three or four of the areas of the DNA that God has placed in us. One, he's placed in us faith. Secondly, he's placed in us favor. Thirdly, he's placed within us a capacity not only to receive forgiveness from God, but to extend forgiveness and to receive forgiveness for ourselves and uh, forgive ourselves. And the last thing we looked at was that uh, God has given us his love and that we have to keep ourselves rooted and grounded in his love, that no matter what challenges or storms we might face with, the, the soil of his love that we are rooted in will never give way as long as I've set my roots in there deeply so that they can't be, they can't be uprooted and be challenged. Amen? So this morning, we're going to look at four more areas that I believe are critical and, and realizing that all of these are working together. We take them apart for study, but you recognize that they're all going to work hand in hand. They're all going to work together. So this morning, we're going to look at four more of the areas that I believe these are keys or elements of the DNA that God has placed on the inside of you to help you to overcome. Number one is that God has placed in us a, a spirit of peace. He's called us to a covenant of peace so that we have God's peace down on the inside of us so that no matter what challenges that we are faced with, that we can have peace on the inside of us. You see, realizing that that, uh, uh, peace is not uh, a lack of external turmoil. Peace is a lack or an absence of internal turmoil. You see, you might be in a storm You might be going through a challenge on the outside in what you see and what's happening in your finances, what's happening in your family, maybe what's even what's happening in your body with your health. But on the inside, on your in your heart, there can be peace and calm, just as though you would be in the center of the eye of a hurricane. Although it's windy on the outside, there's some calm on the inside. Amen. And so that's God's peace. The word in the Old Testament is the word shalom, which means wholeness, and it's not uncommon. My understanding is Hebrew people or Jewish people, when they enter someone's home, they will say shalom, and when they leave the home, they will say shalom, and that word means to be whole. In other words, it means that there's a wholeness about you. There's nothing lacking, nothing broken, nothing missing, and what they're saying is that may God always give you peace. May God always make you whole. May God make your life and your your existence complete and whole and sound. And so we recognize the New Testament, the word there is irene in the Greek, and it has the same meaning as the Old Testament shalom does. And so realizing the word says in, in, in Psalm 119, 165, the word says, and King David said it this way, he said, great peace Have they who love your law. And so what happens is the more I love God's law, the more I love God's word, the more I spend time in God's word and find out what he intends for me, what his word says, then it doesn't matter what goes on out there because the word in me is bigger than the challenge out there then the opportunity that I'm facing out there that may want to cause me some confusion, cause me some anxiety, cause me to walk in worry, and cause me to walk in fear. The Word says that when I love His law, then there's going to be some great peace that's going to come into my heart. And so that's one key is that I need to get into His law. Proverbs chapter 3 says, My son, do not forget my law. But let your, comm- let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life, and I like this, and peace will they add to you. It's interesting, he says, length of days and long life and peace. Glory to God. Well, that means the word goes on the inside of me, and it's going to provide good days, and it's going to provide long life. I like that one. The older I get, I like the long life thing. And, and and peace. Amen. Listen, it's not any good to live to be a hundred if, 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 if you're all in confusion. 
I mean, it's, a, it's not a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing to live that long. But if you're going to live that long, you just as soon be at peace while you're doing it. And let me say it this way. If you're at peace with it, if you're at peace with your life, the chances are you live longer. <laughs> Amen? And it's because the, the more anxiety you have, the shorter that's going to cause the situations in your life. I like Psalm, I mean, Isaiah 26, 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Keep him in perfect peace. Now, the, the word there, it says, it keep him in peace, peace. When they, the, the Hebrew uses two words together, uh, connected, it means that it is, brings it to another level. There's an area of peace, but it brings it to another level where he says it's perfect peace. In other words, when you've got perfect peace, there's nothing that can, that can disturb you. There's nothing that will... Now, now please, don't, don't misunderstand me. We are all humans, and, and we all have emotions. And we all have the, the, perhaps the tendency, some people have more of the tendency to be uh, what we call worry warts or individuals who have a tendency to be anxious than others. But God says that if I get his word and I get into his presence, then he can keep me in perfect peace. When my mind is stayed on him and his word, instead of stayed on the, ch the challenge and the trouble and the circumstance, it's all a matter of focus. Because some things that are outside of you, you cannot, listen carefully, you cannot control them. You cannot change them. You cannot alter them. There are some things you can, and those things you can will glory to God. But there are some things you cannot change. So you have to prevent those things that you cannot change from changing you. And, and, and that means getting your mind off of the word, getting your focus off of the word. Romans chapter 12, verse 18 says, as much as it depends on you. Now, this is, this is one of those verses that it's always kind of a little bit difficult to, to grasp. But he says, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. That means... You can't hold anything against anybody. That means if they do something against you, you can't hold it against them. You've got to release them. We looked at forgiveness last time. But you have to live at peace with them, and you have to be at peace with them, even though they're not at peace with you. A number of years ago, when we first started the church, I was doing some house painting. You know, when you, church, when you start a church and you've got... Seven people in the church, and five is your family, and three of those are kids. There's not a lot of money coming into the church. And so I was house painting at the time. And so I contracted with a, a, a lady. She had me come and uh, give her a bid to paint her house, and I had a contract. I, I tried to do it right, and I think that's why some of the reasons why I got so much work at the time was because I had a contract, and I would say, listen, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to provide this, and this is everything I'm going to do, and I had it all, all uh, itemized out, and she signed it, and I signed it. And so I went about my business, and I painted her house and scraped all the stuff that needed to be scraped and replaced all the rotted wood that needed to be, to be replaced and, and so forth and got the house where I was satisfied with the job. But in the, in the, in the contract, there was always a provision for a callback. In the event that she wasn't satisfied with something, that she could call me back one time and I would go and fix whatever it was she needed to be fixed. Well, I found out after the fact that she didn't even own the house. She was renting the house, and she was endeavoring to try to buy the house, and she wanted everything, minor detail, fixed in the house that went beyond the painting. And so I always got 50% up front to do the work and 50% at the end of the job when they were satisfied. And so for uh, at the end of the job, I said, how does it look? She said, well, I'll let you know. And I, so I left, you know, feeling fairly satisfied that the job was complete.
Well, about two or three days later, I got a phone call and said, listen, there's a few areas I'd like for you to look at. I said, well, make a punch list because I want to do them all when I get there. So I took one day and I went over to her house and she showed me a list of about four or five things. And so I proceeded to get the materials and clean them up and get all this stuff done and repaint and whatever needed to be done. And so uh, I said, how's that look? She said, that looks fine. And so I said, well, you can just mail the check or you can give me a check. She said, well, I'll get it to you. And so three or four days later, I got another call. She said, there's a few more items. And so I said, well, you know that's an extra $50 for a callback. Well, she said, you didn't finish the job the first time. So I went back, and, and so uh, I, I took those items, and I fixed those items, and, and then she called me back three or four times, made me feel like, my goodness, what, you know, I just didn't do a good job, and yet uh, she called me back three or four times, and each time there was something else that she disagreed with, and it was really becoming nitpicky. So I got to the place where I realized that there's nothing I can do to please this woman. There was nothing I could do to make her at peace with the job. So I went in with my invoice the last time, and I found what needed to be done again, or she showed me, and it was like, you got to be kidding me. So I went back, and I don't remember all the details, but I went back, and I corrected it, and when I got finished, I said, now listen, come see. I said, let me show you something. I said, here's my invoice. I said, you gave me a check for half of it up front. You owe me the other half. I've been back, I think I went back five or six times. I said, that would be another $300 added to this invoice. Now, you got an ink pen? She said, yeah. I said, give me your ink pen. I took the ink pen and I wrote on there, paid in full. I said, now I want you to read this. I said, I ain't coming back. I said, this is as good a job as I can do. If you want somebody that can do a better job, you'll have to call someone else. I said, I'm going to write this off. I said, because I'm, I'm walking away, and I said, I'm finished. I realized there was nothing I could do to please her. And, and so it's costing me time and energy and money. And so I don't know how much money I left on the table, but I walked away. Then she made the statement. She said, oh, does that mean you don't want to bid on the inside? <laughs> I said, I said, madam, not no, but uh-uh. We are walking away. And so, but you know what? I, have, I, I, I hardly ever recall that. Other than for times of illustration, I walked away from it and I had peace because I had done everything I could do in me to make her satisfied. I realized it wasn't going to happen, so I, 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 so to speak, cut my losses and moved on. Amen. And so we realized. Now watch this. Uh. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 says this. Let peace rule in your heart. That word rule is, this, is a word that could have been translated umpire. Let peace be the guardian of your heart. When you have peace as the guardian of your heart and things begin to come in and they start res wanting to reside in there that causes anxiety or worry or fear, then you need to let peace rise up and say, no, I need to spend extra time in the Word to get that peace on the inside of me, to, to return that peace to the guardianship, to the, to, the, to, the, to the rulership of my heart. Why? Because I'm not going to have an ulcer over somebody else's problem. See, if I can release that, now if I've created a problem, then I need to correct it. I need to do what I need to do to correct it. But if it's somebody else that's got the problem, I can't let that come into my heart and affect me. Amen. Number two, and this, this, is, this is the good one. Peace is good, but this is the good one. Uh, God has given us the capacity. You ready for this? He's given us the capacity to be patient. Now, some people are more patient 
naturally than others. But God's given us the capacity to be patient. Uh, James said it this way, My brethren, count it all joy when you face various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Patience is that quality or force that doesn't surrender to circumstances or succumbs under trial. Webster's Dictionary says this, Patience is an expectation with calmness, without discontent, undisturbed by obstacles, delays, or failures. Now, some people think, well, patience, and I'm just going to pray for patience. Some people tell you you shouldn't pray for patience. That patience is not something, because when you pray for patience, God will cause something to happen in your life. You'll have to exercise that patience. You'll have to be patient concerning that situation. I don't know about that. I know that patience is, is, a, is, is, is part of the fruit of the Spirit. I know that patience is something that's available to us, and that patience was not, is not just twiddling my thumbs waiting for this circumstance to pass. But patience is standing on the word, recognizing that God's word can change things. God's word can change circumstances. The word says that if I wait on the Lord, he will renew my strength. And so patience is not just waiting idly by doing nothing. Patience is digging into the word, finding out what God's word says, and recognizing that the circumstances and the things around me are not going to change me. See, sometimes it's a matter of timing. We're wanting it to happen yesterday. I want it to happen right now. But sometimes God says, I am ordering things out there. I'm ordering things behind the curtains and behind the scenes that you can't see. And if you try to make it happen, you will flub things up. You will mess things up. And you'll delay it and prolong it even longer or further or delay it to the place where it can't happen. So I've got to know and I've got to move only when God says move. Do only what God says do. In fact, look at with me, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter 8. This is, this is um, just one of a, an awesome verse of Scripture. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse number 25. It said, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait eagerly for it with, and now the King, New King James says perseverance. The King James says with patience. We wait for it with patience. If we're hoping for something we can't see, how many of you are hoping for something you can't see? Well, he says, we eagerly wait for it with patience. Now, watch this. Look at verse 26. It's all connected. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So that means when I'm hoping for the thing that I can't see, I'm not just twiddling my thumbs doing nothing. I am tapping into the realm of the Spirit by praying in the Spirit. I'm I'm tapping into God by letting his spirit pray through me and understanding that God is going to help my weakness and help my, my situation and my circumstance so that I can get beyond this thing and he's going to cause it to take place. Now watch this, verse 27. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So I've got to understand that patience tell me that no matter what the circumstance is, it's going to change. This thing is going to take place. It's going to come to pass. This thing didn't come to stay in my life. It came to pass out of my life or through my life, and it's not going to change me. But sometimes I need to have that patience. 
I need to, I need to just be, be quiet and know that God is God and that he can work those things out on our behalf. Amen. That he causes those things to work out for our good, not causes out to work out for our detriment. Amen. Uh, patience is clear, is cheerful endurance. It's calm endurance without complaining or losing self-control. And so it, it, it has a, a, a sense of being under control within myself. That even though I'm going through a difficulty, I can be cheerful. I can have a smile on my face. I can have a spring in my step. You know, it's not, it's not hard to see people who, you know, you just know, you look at them from a distance, and you can tell they're having a bad day. <laughs> or you can look at them and say, something good happened to them. You see, the Spirit of God on the inside of us wants us to have the continents about us that uh, no one can tell whether you're having a good day or a bad day. It's, it's just simply God wants... now. You know, you get to be as close as Belinda and I, 43 years of marriage. You just kind of, you just kind of know. Uh, uh oh, <laughs> pastor's got a, he didn't wake up on the right side of the bed this morning. Now, nobody else might know, but, but, but she knows. Uh, or, or just that, that look, you know. Anybody else have, have one of those looks where somebody, when you, when you, when Somebody looks at you, they'll say, what? <laughs> wait, wait, are, are you okay? <laughs> uh, you know, we all, we all have that, I think. But the Word says, and, and, and that patience is, I need, to, uh, I need to understand that God wants those things to happen, take place in my life. He wants me to go through these things, walk through them, have the victory, and overcome every situation and er every circumstance. Um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36 says, For we need patience or endurance so that after we've done the will of God, we may receive the promise. We've got to recognize that it's not just sitting back on our blessed assurance and not just doing anything, but rather it is finding God's will for me at that moment in that given situation. You see, there's sometimes every moment in life Every situation in life can be a teaching moment. What is it do I need to learn about this circumstance? What is it that God's trying to teach me in this circumstance? Maybe he's trying to teach me how to keep my mouth shut. Maybe he's trying to teach me how to spend uh, more quality time and trust in him. Maybe he's trying to teach me uh, what paths and avenues that I should not have gone down at this circumstance, at this time in my life. Maybe he's teaching me timing. And so in every circumstance, I need to say, okay, Lord, this is not pleasant. And I don't want to be here. But while I'm here, what does it do I need to learn while I'm here? What is it that you want to teach me at this time and this situation in my life? Jeremy, would you go and turn the air conditioner on, see some people fanning themselves? You know how to do that? Just press the, just press the two arrows in the upper right-hand corner, press them down until it gets down below the number on the left. Hallelujah. Number three, we talked about peace. We talk about patience. Now we're going to talk a little bit about joy. Because, you know, that joy, the, the word says that this, the joy of the Lord is what? Is your strength. Listen, if the devil can steal your joy, if circumstances can steal your joy, they will steal your peace and they'll steal your patience. And they'll steal everything else that you can. It'll steal, it'll steal your, your, your time. It'll steal your strength. It'll steal the capacity that, that God has put on the inside of you so that you can overcome. Joy is that commodity that's it's, it's not determined. Again, it's not determined by outward circumstances. Listen, I can be happy because things out there are quiet. 
I can be happy because my kids are behaving themselves. I can be happy because all my bills are paid. I can be happy because my, my body is, 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 is out of pain. Those things can make me happy. But I tell you, listen, those things can change in a heartbeat. And so if the outward circumstances is all that I use to make me happy or give me joy, and those circumstances and situations change, then my inner continence changes, and I get sapped of the strength that God has extended for me. Again, uh, the word says in Psalm 16, he said that in his presence is the fullness of joy. So I recognize that God lives on the inside of me by his spirit. And so he's brought with me, with, uh, into me, this capacity to be joyful in my life. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm bouncing off the walls. It doesn't necessarily mean that i am just got this, this bubbly all the time. But what it means is that nothing can disturb what God has placed on the inside of me. Amen? And so we realize that, you know, we, 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 uh, this was said at Word of Prophecy this morning. Psalm 30, verse 5 says, Sing praises to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is for, but for a moment, his favor for a li- for, is for life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Well, you know, that's what the Word says. But I'm telling you that there are some people who go to bed weeping and they wake up the next morning and there still isn't any joy. They're still weeping. David said on a number of times, he said, I wet my bed through the night with weeping. But you know, we realize that God says it is potential and it is possible to turn those things loose. And now while you're sleeping, God is working for you. And when you, you go to bed, you might be weeping in the natural, but you can be rejoicing in the spirit. And when the word says, I'm to rejoice and rejoice in him always, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, I can rejoice even in the situation and the circumstances that are not pleasant, that are not fun. I can rejoice knowing why? Because God is able to turn this thing around. God is able and he's bigger and better than any challenge or any difficulty I might be faced. And he has called me to be an overcomer. Glory to God. Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3 says this. Behold, God is my salvation. I will will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He's my strength. He's my song. He's the one that puts that joy on the inside of me. And I can sing his praises no matter what challenges I face out there, whether they be in my body, in my finances, in my relationships, in my job. I can rejoice knowing that my God is stronger. My God is the one who puts a song on the inside of me. It might not be my job. might not be my health that puts a joy. And a, and, a, and a song in me, but God can put that song on the inside of me. But now watch the next, the next part of that verse says this. Therefore, if God puts a song in your heart, a rejoicing in your heart, and I like that verse from 1 Thessalonians, which says that uh, we rejoice in him in all things. Every situation and every circumstance We rejoice in him. Now watch this. It says, therefore, with joy, you draw water from the wells of salvation. And when we look at that verse of scripture, the, the, the picture that I get is, how many of you ever watch one of the old Western movies? And they've got a, a well, uh, 
and, and it's a water well, and it's got stones all the way around it. And they've got two uprights and a cross piece, and right in the center of the cross piece, there's a, there's a pulley, and there's a rope on that pulley. You've seen those, you've seen those, and, and you, throw the, you throw the bucket down, and you know, they've got a big knot on the end of the rope so that the bucket and the rope doesn't go all at the same time down in the well. So uh, it, it drops in the well, and they draw what? They draw some water out of that well. There's always refreshing. There's always water. Uh, I don't know why they water their horses first. But they water the horses. And then they take a, a drink themselves. And then they put the bucket on the side. There's refreshing from that water coming from the well. But notice it says the wells. In other words, there's more than one well contained in God's salvation. That word salvation, when we look at it, it means, it means health, it means wholeness, it means deliverance, it means protection, it means just help when help is needed. Amen? And so we recognize that when I'm rejoicing, when I give God the glory for my, for my life, regardless of the circumstances, I'm not praising him for the problem. I'm praising him in midst of the problem, in spite of the problem. I've got the problem out there, and it's not in me. And God's going to cause me to overcome that problem because I'm rejoicing. And as I rejoice, I'm throwing that, well, that, that bucket down into that well. And I'm going to draw out of that well that that I need from God. Amen. And it's going to be the rejoicing of my heart. It's going to be the song that I sing. It's going to bring that peace and that patience and, and that joy is going to come. And it's going to give me the strength that I need. Remember, it's the strength that you're looking for. It's the strength that the enemy tries to come and steal from you. And so if you can keep yourself strengthened and built up in the Lord, then the devil no matter what he tries to throw at you, he will not succeed. Amen? And so we draw from that well of salvation. And that bucket is the Holy Spirit that we just dip in and we receive and we strengthen ourselves in. Amen? Now the fourth area that we want to look at just briefly this afternoon is, uh, is what's called the anointing. When you look at the word Jesus Christ, it says Jesus, the anointed one, and his anointing. And so the anointing is God's bestowment of power, of capacity upon an individual. Isaiah chapter 10 verse 27 says, and it shall come to pass that, his, that this burden shall be taken off of your shoulders and his yoke will be be taken off of your neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. Now, when we use the word anointing, uh, how many of you have ever used uh, some products for sore muscles? Um, how many of you used Ben Gay this morning? <laughs> I, I have a product at home. It's called, and I didn't know what it was. I bought it, said it was a pain reliever. I can't hardly use the stuff because it is so strong on your nose. You just go do this, and I mean, it clears up all your sinuses. It's called tea tree oil, and it's, it's some kind of a gummy oil substance that you put it on, and I don't put it on before I go to work because I'll smell that all day long. I don't put it on before I go to bed because it'll get all over the sheets. I put it on and then go take a shower almost immediately. Why? Because I don't want that smell. Realize that what word anointing talks about rubbing on, smearing on, painting over, rubbing in. And so you get, the, you get the Holy Spirit. He's the one. God anointed what? Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. And so he wants to anoint us with the Holy Spirit so that in every circumstance, in every situation, we are equipped to overcome because of the anointing and the strength 
and the power and the, what the Holy Spirit brings to us, amen, brings into our life. And so we recognize that we can be uh, uh, anointed by the Holy Spirit, anointed with that power that Jesus was anointed with. He, Jesus said, I go to the Father, and he's going to send you another comforter, and he's going to be with you. He's going to be in you. And so we recognize that the Holy Spirit is the one who, who anoints us. You remember Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, he said, be strengthened with might in your inner man by the Spirit. And so that's going to cause us to stand in peace and stand in patience and stand in joy. The Holy Spirit strengthening our heart because of the anointing that God has placed on us. You remember in Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. A number of years ago, probably in the 30s, there was a, a, a blimp that was being brought into into Chicago, and that was the way of uh, much air tra tra transportation at the time. You could see quite a few people in it, and it was coming in for, for a landing, and there were always some guys that would catch the rope and tie the rope out, anchor it down before people could get, could get out of the blimp. Well, uh, at this time, they were, they were pulling it all in, and all of a sudden, there was a gust of wind that came and elevated and lifted the blimp, and, and everybody let go but one guy. And so he's holding it up, and, you know, they finally, the, the engine, the, the controller up there, the, the, the pilot got c control of the blimp and, and didn't go very far, but it's way up there, and he's trying to get it back down, and the wind is too strong, and, and everybody's watching and looking at this guy up there, you know, holding on to this rope, and said, how long can he hold on? Because others had dropped off, you know, uh, some broke ankles, and, and this guy's two or three hundred feet in the air, and says, how long? long can he hold on? And, and, and so finally, after a couple of hours, the, the pilot gets the thing back, and they grab it, and they anchor it. And so the, the people asked him, he says, how did you hold on so long? He says, oh, I didn't hold on. He said, I realized I was too hot to, to drop off. So he said, I just climbed up a little higher, grabbed the end of the rope, tied a knot, had the best view of Chicago I've ever had. And so you got to realize sometimes you're trying to hold on to something. All you've got to do is climb on into God. Let him hold on to you so that you can have the best view of that circumstance and that problem and that situation. Why? Because God wants to cause you to overcome in that area. Amen. Now, realize, now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. And the word says, now thanks be to God who always, say always, always, always causes us to triumph in Christ. He always causes us to triumph, how? In the anointed one and in the anointing. Glory to God. He always causes us to triumph. So if I stay in Christ, if I stay in God, if I stay in the word, I'm, I'm assured to come out victorious. I'm, I'm assured to come out on top. I'm assured that this circumstance is not going to do me in. I'm going to get over this thing, and I'm going to overcome and be victorious on the other side. Now look at the next verse. And in him, let me get it, and I want to read it right. And through us, he diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So now watch this. This is not, this is, this is spiritual Bengay. Everywhere you go, people ought to be able to smell the anointing. People ought to be able to sense the anointing. Every situation in your life, every difficulty in your life... 
people around you. It says in every place that you go, there's a fragrance about you. There's something about you. There's something that people say, I don't know what's going on, why this is happening, but there's something about that person. There's something about Miss Sally. I know what she's going through and the things going on in her life. There's, there's something about Phyllis. There's something about Dale. There's something about them. I don't know. I can't put my finger on it, but there's something there. And what is it? That's the anointing. Because why? Because the anointing says, you know, I got peace in my heart. I'm not, not pleasant what I'm going through, but I got peace there. I got patience, and I'm learning all that I need to know while God has me in this place. He's got me in this place of protection, and I'm going to come through it, and I'm going to be smarter. I'm going to be wiser. I'm going to be stronger. I'm going to be better. I'm going to be more equipped for the next challenge that the enemy might throw my way. Amen? Because I'm, I'm coming through in the name of Jesus. Now, you realize it, it, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10, we're going we're gonna to close with that verse. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse, actually verse 6, it says, It's not by power, it's not by might, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And when we look at those words, we see this. It's not by our intellect. It's not by our education. It's not by our, our capacity to learn and our smartness and our cunningness. It's not by the strength of a man. It's not by the strength of the horse. It is by the Spirit of God that is on the inside of us that he causes us to overcome and speak to the mountain. It has to go. And so we've looked at some, some uh, uh, elements of DNA for every believer. But guess what? Just because they're in there doesn't mean they're going to work until you activate them. Until you discover them. And then you begin to walk in them. And so what I'd say is, is be sure you get more of the word. Take the messages. Listen to the CDs again. Get your concordance out. Look for some of these other passages that have to do with joy and peace and patience and the anointing so that you can, you can build yourself up, as Jude says, in your most holy faith. And, and, and I tell you, one of the things that I think is critical in, today's, in, in, our, in our life today, I think this is critical. Remember we said eight Romans 8, 26, that the Spirit prays through us. I believe the Holy Spirit and the prayer language that he brings to you has been relegated to a side issue in today's church. Not so much here, but I believe that it's imperative that we pray in the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 says that when I pray in the Spirit, I build myself up, I edify myself. You know, when you pray in the Spirit, that becomes the, you might say, the, the portal or the open door for the supernatural in your life. When I begin to continue to pray in the Spirit, and as I pray more in the Spirit, then more of those elements, can God can then speak to my heart and speak to my mind in how to operate those things. I think praying in the, in, in the Holy Spirit, praying in our prayer language is essential in today's culture, in our, in our life today, so that he can help us to overcome those difficulties and those battles that are, that are raging in the culture and raging trying to come in to destroy our families, destroy our homes, destroy our churches, and destroy our lives. And the only way we can maintain a, a, a level of competency and resistance is that I've got the strength on the inside of me. So I need not just the Word, but I need the Spirit. It's not just standing on the Word. I've got I've to be standing on the Word and standing in the Spirit. Amen? Does that make sense? 
And so we need to realize it's time that we stop playing games about church and get real about church and get real about who we are as the believers, get real about who we are and stop living on the fence, trying to think how much of the world I can, I can live in without falling over on that side. I've got to get as far away from that fence as I possibly can and live in the realm of the Spirit. Now you realize you're going to be in the world, but there are some things you just got to turn off the boob tube, turn off the TV set, get away from some of the things that want to, uh, that are avenues for the world to come into your life and come into your mind and close the door to that and open the door to the Spirit of God. Amen. Open the door to more of what His Spirit wants. So this morning, we're going to, uh, we're going to close with, with a song. Uh, but before we go to that, I, I want to ask, I've got a couple of altar calls. One is if you're, you're not born again, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, then, then this morning don't go home without having made Jesus your Lord. D don't go home without knowing for sure that your salvation is assured, that heaven has a, has a place for you, that God through Jesus has made a place for you. It's not dependent upon your history. It's not dependent upon your life. It's not dependent upon, your, uh, upon anything that you've done, but the one choice of what did you do with Jesus. And if you don't know for sure that, you, that heaven is your home, then I want you to lift your hand. I want to pray with you. I want you to be sure to know that you are a child of God. Doesn't matter how old you are, it's you are a child of God. Anybody like that here? 